Okay, so last time, uh, previous video here, I left off talking about something called Zeno's Paradox, uh, and I mentioned something called Periodic Boundary Conditions, which all those are is it's something where something like wraps, so when something wraps around on itself, and it like has to come back to the same value at the beginning and the end, right? Um, and so it's because there's uh, a few different types of boundary conditions. Uh, there's what's called open boundary conditions, where it's like everything it can just be whatever and it's all loosey-goosey. Uh, and there's fixed boundary conditions where things are, well, fixed. Uh, and there's periodic boundary conditions where uh, they're not fixed to anything in particular uh, other than it has to come back to itself. Uh, after some like distance, like the length of this paper wrapping around on itself. Um, we won't talk about those in detail for quite some time, though. Uh, I just wanted to mention that real quick, uh, because it's a, it just gets at some things I like to talk about. Um, we are This is not going to be a course on set theory or a course on category theory, um, and it's not really going to be a course on calculus either, so we're not going to do the a level of extreme mathematical formalism that's required to really, really prove the, some of these mathematical theorems. Uh, my goal is just to uh, explain things in my own way um, and, I don't know, add to the zeitgeist uh, whatever it is that I can add. So, like, let's get started. Right? So Zeno's paradox, right, has this issue I was talking about where, you know, it doesn't actually take Achilles an infinite amount of time to pass the tortoise, right? That makes absolutely no sense, you know? And it's, in some ways, gets at th something like this, right? Where it's like, well, how specific do you want to be about exactly where halfway is, right? If you spend all of your time specifying where halfway is, of course you'll never get halfway there, right? So, you know... <laughs> What, 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 why am I talking about this, right? Why not just say, you know, there is a distance, call it X miles, and then be however specific you want to be and be done with it, right? And, you know, we already have this system of numbers that we use, uh, fractions, integers, and uh, decimal numbers, which is what we're going to talk about next. And so we use those to, like, describe the world, <laughs> you know? And... Well, decimals are really just did it fractions in disguise, right? Because, you know, what is 1.0? Well, that's just 1 plus 0 over 10. What's 1.00? That's, you know, it's, you know, 1 plus 0 over 10 plus like 0 over 100 plus question mark, question mark, question mark, uh, and so on and so forth, you know? So, like, the reason for that is we don't want to go through and specify every single time and then add this fraction of 10. So we have this standardized system of writing down numbers with a dot afterwards and then all of these little extra numbers that are actually fractions of 10. Or fractions, uh, with, fractions with powers of 10 as the denominator, I should say. So like, okay, what do we do with that? How do we go back and say, you know, this is the distance, you know, and so, you know, okay, well, you might say, there's no problem at all. I'll just be however specific, you know, I want to be and, you know, be done with it. Well, in math and physics, that's not necessarily good enough, right? In science in general, we have to be careful about how specific we are and why, and in physics in particular, and in calculus, we need to be very careful. Um, and I, I actually pulled a bit of a bait and switch there, right, where I said physics and calculus, because in physics, it's still like the rest of science, where we need to be careful about how specific we are because we're being scientific, but it's just ratcheted up a bit because it's physics. But in calculus, we're doing mathematics, so we need to be completely specific in order to get anything done. So... Let's look at this again, you know, and if you look at the bottom here, you'll see I've written scientific notation. So I'm going to assume that anybody watching this knows what scientific notation is. If you don't, uh, let me know in the comment section and I'll do a very quick tutorial on scientific notation. So far, nobody watches these except 
uh, my friend Catherine being nice and subscribing. So, uh, Catherine, I'm pretty sure you know scientific notation, but uh, if anybody else doesn't, uh, let me know in the comments section. And so at the bottom, I have 1.0 plus or my, or sorry, I have, yeah, uh, 1.00 plus or minus 0 0.001, or sorry, 0 0.01 times 10 to the power of 2, which is really 100 plus or minus 1. So why do we write it like that? Well, we write it like that because we don't make our measurements with infinite precision, right? When I say, you know, my house is X miles away from work, you know, what if I didn't have the ability to go on Google Maps and look it up, right? Well, I would have to actually measure it. And how would I measure it? Well, like, I don't have a mile stick, so I'm going to have to just take... Uh, probably either either just take an individual ruler that's just one foot long, or, or at least take like a, a yardstick uh, and measure in sections of three feet at a time how many of those sections it takes to get all the way to work, and I will get some answer, right? And I want to specify that answer in this particular format. And we'll talk about why in more detail with my next slide. So let's say you want to go to work and it's only one kilometer. Hooray, you have a one kilometer commute. That's pretty fortunate. <laughs> so for you, the halfway point is 500 meters. So since we're measuring things conveniently in kilometers, you say, cool, I will measure this one kilometer distance from my house to work. So you just put the meter stick down you know, time after time after time. And when you get there, you notice you've done it a thousand times and you're like, okay, so it's 1000 meters, one kilometer, one kilometer. Okay, that's cool. So then the halfway point, you say, all right, well, half of a thousand is 500 meters. But the problem is you probably know when you get to work, it doesn't actually happen that the meter stick lands right doorstep to doorstep perfectly, right? You start it perfectly at your doorstep as you're like, you know, you know, like you put it up against the doorstep as you're leaving. But then when you get to work, you know, it's probably not right up against the doorstep. It's probably like, you know, maybe halfway back or something like that. And so, you know, okay, it's, you know, 1,000 and a half meters but it's not 1,000 and a half, you know, you would need to actually take the little meter sec, you know, the centimeter sections and actually look, and that's only in centimeters, and then you'd have to go down to millimeters, and then you'd really to, 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 to get any better, you know, and so on and so forth, right? So it's, it's like, where do you stop? And um, there's deeply connected answers to that question in mathematics and in physics, and in physics, the answer is you stop at whatever the level of precision that you can manage is, or whatever the level of precision that you need is. But in mathematics, you have to stop at the level of precision that you can, uh, based on whatever logical assumptions you're making that allow you to stop at that point. So now let's look at maybe a little bit more complicated uh, situation. Let's say that you have a distance that you want to go that's a kilometer away, but you know, maybe you feel like taking a different route sometimes and you don't go straight there and you say, take this route that goes up a little bit and then, you know, maybe goes back down later. Um, so there's say 700 meters um, out to this first point and then another 400 meters on this, uh, on this other leg here. So, well, that's going to be like 1.1 kilometers. So that's a little bit further. Uh, okay, so that's fine, you know, you, you're being a little bit more specific, but it's not that complicated. So, you know, maybe the, maybe this is 700, you know, so the 700 meters isn't exactly 700 meters, you know, it's going to be like 700.12835 meters or something like that. And same thing with the 400 meters. It's also not going to be exactly 400 meters. So now you have two quantities that you want to add together that don't have, <clears throat> you know, infinite specificity. And you got to figure out how to do that in an intelligent manner if you want to figure out the total distance. And then there's an even, so this is sort of the, 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 the physics side of things where you want to learn how to do um, significant figures and error propagation correctly, uh, which is what we're going to talk about next. And the other thing is the more mathematical thing, which is actually the more organic looking shape on the bottom where you take this long windy path. And you may see I have on there this sort of like 
straight line that sort of approximates the squiggly line, uh, but not completely, right? And so, well, imagine if you only had a meter stick that was, say, t you know, like maybe 100 meters long, or maybe 50 meters long, you know, it, you wouldn't be able to, 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 to get down into every little curve that you, you were following there. So then your lack of specificity in your lack of sort of, like, decimal places, uh, essentially, is a very serious problem, uh, and it's it's a sort of a, a mathematical one, you know? So, like, that's something that you, like, you can't just say, oh, we'll make the instruments more precise later. It's, like, an actual mathematical thing. So uh, if you want to use the mathematical tools, you, you, you're going to have to, to, to resolve that to, to, to some extent. Not to an extent that would satisfy a mathematician, but uh, trust me, it's it's very difficult to, to satisfy mathematicians. <laughs> um so, so let's go back to this, though. Let's go back to, you know, it's it's one kilometer, you know, ish, right? So maybe it's 1.000, right? So if it's if it's plus or minus one meter, uh, that would be like, you know, a thousand plus or minus one. So then that would be like, you know, this, you know, you could say it's 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 exactly one meter. Uh, but then say say the, the, the last meter stick, it you know, reach you reach a thousand meters and the meter stick instead of reaching all the way to work, it's, you know, almost there, but then to go another full meter, you would go past it. So, okay, what do you do now? Well, you know, you say, okay, well, it's 1,000 point something, and this is this is how you do that, right? You say, uh, I don't know exactly, but it's about 1,000 plus or minus, uh, you know, this is 100 plus or minus 1, so in that case, it would be 1,000 plus or minus 1, uh, and, you know, that's what you do, okay? And so then, if you have something like this, uh, then you can then combine those distances in an intelligent manner. And I don't want this lecture to go on too long, so we're going to talk about how to actually do error propagation next time. Uh, but just be thinking about this, right? That you want to be, you know, the amount of specificity you want is based on the amount of precision you have. You know, just be thinking about that basic concept. And be thinking about that, uh, especially as it connects to something like this. So... The next thing I want to talk about on top of all of that is time. So, how do we deal with time? Measuring distance is relatively simple. You just measure the distance. And, well, you just take some standard length. Again, you know, say take a piece of paper or something and just, you know, say, you know, here's one piece of paper. Here's two pieces of paper. Here's three pieces of paper and so on and so forth, right? And you count up the distance. So how do you do that for time? Well, you use something like a day. You know, you say, okay, it takes the same amount of time for the sun to go up and go down. Well, actually, it doesn't take the same amount of time for the sun to go up and come up and go down every day, does it? But it takes the approximately the same amount of time in between sunrises, so the sun comes up approximately 24 hours after it came up the previous day. So you may already be realizing, though, so, oh, you know, you, you know, our, our standards can vary, right? So just like this piece of paper, its, its length can vary with temperature and pressure and a bunch of other things where it's, you know, it's not going to change a lot. But, like, you know, if I, if I pull really hard on this paper, it'll stretch out a little bit and it won't exactly be 11 inches long. Uh, or if I maybe heat this paper up... Uh, it will also expand and the length won't be exactly the same. And if I cool it down, it'll contract and the length won't be exactly the same. Uh, that's the one physics principle that my aunt said she could always remember is that heat expands and cold contracts. So, um, you know, I guess that's something that uh, everybody can remember. And so with time, it's it's even more complicated because it's it's difficult to get a handle on how much time has gone by, right? Because with an object, you know, you just have the object. With an event like a day, sure, every day is about the same length, but it, there's actually uh, more than one way to define a day. Uh, you can essentially define it as the time between when the sun is in the same place in the sky, or you can define it as the time between when a star is in the same place in the sky. And so then now you're starting to run into an even bigger problem, though, right? Which is you might quickly realize that you know, with this problem of going to work, you know, it's like, okay, we have to specify things in meters and kilometers, and you wish we had a kilometer stick, because a meter is a uh, very fine resolution, it's annoying to have to count it up a thousand times. But we're very much having the opposite problem with days, uh, 
where, you know, a day is a day, and most processes that we want to measure, uh, certainly it doesn't take most people all day long to commute to work. And so, like, you need a better resolution. So you say, okay, well, let's divide days into pieces. But it's like, well, then you have to know when it's halfway through the day, don't you? And so we need something that we can use as a timing standard in addition to things we can use as a length standard. Because for a length standard, we have better definitions of a length today. But classically, you can always just, you know, take some object, define that as your length standard, you know, lock it in a vault somewhere and then make copies of it anytime you want to make uh, rulers or meter sticks or yardsticks. So what do you do for time? Well, I'm going to have to reach down here because I accidentally dropped my pendulum when I was testing it out earlier. <laughs> but, well, we use something like a pendulum that happens at a regular interval, but which is not necessarily always the same interval, but it's close enough that you can use it as your timing standard. And the reason that pendulums are so popular is they're so simple and universal. And I'm going to just demonstrate this very quickly whenever I manage to get this dental floss around my little magnetic tetrahedron of science that I'm using as the plumb bob for my pendulum here. So let me wrap this string around my finger and just go ahead and swing this pendulum back and forth, right? So this is not meant to hypnotize you. If I wanted to do that, I would just add a soundtrack. <laughs> so you'll notice it takes about the same amount of time every time the pendulum swings. So say like one one thousand, you know, so approximately a second, right? Or one hippopotamus. So approximately one second. But I, I timed it earlier and it's a little bit longer than one second with this piece of string. And so, well, okay, that's 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 much easier, right? Well, we'll just count up how many times this pendulum swings back and forth on our way to work. But the astute amongst you might quickly say, well, hold on, you just saw the pendulum slip on my finger, maybe. Uh, it's pretty difficult to make sure that that keeps the same timing standard for uh, all that time and to have that precise resolution. Uh, and you'd be absolutely right, and that's a, a challenging thing to do. And the folks at NIST that make those atomic clocks, and, well, atomic, lots of people make atomic clocks, but... Uh, the folks at the National Institutes of Standard and Technology uh, up in Boulder, Colorado, uh, maintain uh, the atomic clocks that uh, act as a reference timing standard for basically everyone. And uh, it's a whole interesting thing. You can go read about it, and I'll maybe talk about it later. But uh, I, I just want you to understand for now that, that timing, th this problem gets even more complicated, right? And so in physics, we need to measure distance and we need to measure time. And we need to measure them to a particular resolution using some set of standards where we count how many instances of some reference happens, right? We count how many of, you know, some length reference uh, it takes uh, to, like, you know, fit in some distance. You know, this is one paper. This is two papers. And in time, it's the same thing, right? You know, one oscillation. Two oscillations, you know, and so we have to ask this question though about what happens when the resolution of our instrument is too coarse. What happens when it's you know not exactly a thousand meter sticks that you have to put down in order to get all the way from your house to work, but you know it's a thousand plus a little bit more. Or what if you know it's you know not a thousand uh, seconds or I don't know a thousand second is only. A thousand, let's see, 3,600 seconds is an hour or so. Okay, that's that's 20 minutes, I think. Just about is a thousand seconds. And so, well, what happens when it's, you know, not a thousand seconds, but it's 1,000 and a little bit more? So next time I want to talk about that in detail uh, by talking about these processes that involve pendulums swinging back and forth and things like that. And, you know, what happens when, you know, it's, it's, it's not exactly at your reference point. It's at, you know, maybe exactly in the middle or something like that. Um, how do you deal with that situation? And I also, next time, want to talk about a connected question, uh, which is, how do you deal with curves like this? And I want to connect both of those to something, which is... Uh, 
how do you deal with a symbol for something that is not a number but is a concept that drives many, including me, stark raving mad, which is infinity. So next time we're going to start talking about um, what velocity is and like I want to discuss some very basic calculus so that we can discuss a concept called instantaneous velocity, which is essentially just how fast something is going at a particular moment in time, as opposed to how fast it's going on average. And hopefully we'll be able to develop some insight together. What can I say? Hopefully you learned something. I certainly got a chance to review some of my knowledge. Thank you for watching.